Good afternoon and welcome to the Folsom Historical Society. Virtual opening of Women at Work, venturing into the public sphere. I'm Jenny Cole, the Director of Collections Access and one of the exhibit curators. I'm going to start off our virtual opening with some thanks first to our exhibit sponsor, Commonwealth Bank and Trust for continuing to provide their generous support, especially during these challenging times. We truly appreciate their commitment to us and our mission to collect, preserve, and tell the history of the Ohio Valley region. Everything we do at the Filson is done as a team. And as such, on behalf of all the rest of the curators, I really want to recognize our colleagues here for keeping our exhibit alive via our virtual exhibit which is on our Emeka page and our virtual programming, especially Danielle Spalenka, who's our Associate Curator of Digital Projects and our Education and Development team. But really the support of each of our coworkers has been critical throughout the genesis of this exhibit. We've also been very lucky to receive support from colleagues outside of the Filson. The original art in the exhibit has really enhanced our ability to share these stories and we thank Irene Mudd for her time and for her amazing craft. We've received support via research and materials loaned from the University of Kentucky Special Collections Research Center, Julian Warren Payne, the National Council for Jewish Women Louisville Section, Lauren Johnson of the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute at UofL, and Margaret Young and the Women's Club of Louisville. Finally, I definitely want to recognize the contributions of my fellow curators, Maureen Lane, Jana Meyer, Brooks Vessels, and our former colleague, Emily Bankin. We miss you. Working with this incredible group of women for the past few years on this project has really been a joy. In just a moment, we'll be showing a video and tour of the exhibit, which will feature each of us sharing um, some stories from Women at Work. And then we'll be opening the event to a question and answer session with each of us curators. So please feel free and we encourage you to put your questions in the Zoom chat feature and Dr. Patrick Lewis will be moderating them during the second half. In Women at Work, we sought to illuminate Ohio Valley women's roles during the 19th and early 20th centuries. During this time, women stepped outside their homes to seek new roles as professionals and advocates in business, art, education, and reform. They were predecessors, compatriots, and sometimes opponents of their sisters who were agitating for women's rights and suffrage. Whether working to affect social change, realizing their creative potential, or simply providing for their families, these pioneers changed what it meant to be a woman at work. So finally, welcome to the exhibit. <laughs>
my name is Maureen Lane and I'm the curator of museum collections here at the Filson and today I'm going to talk about two women who set out to be artists in the 19th century. Magdalene Harvey McDowell was born in 1829 and lived in Lexington. She was a socialite who had an independent streak that sometimes vexed her family members. As a young woman, she wrote articles for the newspaper, was an abolitionist, and taught herself painting and architectural design. She derived income from land that she had inherited from her mother, and she insisted that she personally handle all the business matters and dealings with the coal companies that leased the land. The University of Kentucky has a really wonderful archive of her photographs and letters, and that really gives us a lot of insight into her life. She painted this picture of her nephew, R.C. Ballard Thruston, in 1863, and during the Civil War, women, women's roles expanded, and when the war ended, women had a critical role in the cultural revitalization of the nation. Magdalene was then in her 40s, and she began to pursue her art more seriously. She even went as far as to apply to the New York School of Design, but instead, she decided to live in New York for a few months, and she studied art in the studio of Emanuel Lutz, known for his painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. She also painted commissions and exhibited her work. McDowell never gave up her interest in architecture, and in 1889, at the age of 60, she patented a design for a fireback that distributed heat in houses. In her 70s, she designed several homes for the Aylesford subdivision in Lexington, and a couple of these houses still stand today. She also designed the children's building at the Bluegrass Sanatorium for tuberculosis. And despite being born to a generation in which women were expected to marry, McDowell forged her own path. She was an important role model to her niece, Madeline McDowell Breckenridge, who became an important leader in the women's suffrage movement. Within the span of a single generation, more opportunities opened for women who wanted to pursue art as a profession, as we see in the case of Patty Thumb, born in 1853, 24 years after McDowell. Patty's mother was widowed during the Civil War, and she insisted that all of her children, including her daughters, go to college. And at the age of 16, Patty went to Vassar College in New York to study art. This photograph was taken at the time of her graduation, and she really looks like a woman who's ready to take on the world. By the time she was 21, she opened her first studio in Louisville. She then exhibits her work in the Louisville Southern Exposition, which was a national venue that led to exhibition opportunities across the country. She became best known for her paintings of flowers, especially roses, but she was always a talented landscape and figure painter, and she continued her studies under Thomas Aikens in New York City. Patty gained commercial success for her flower paintings and sold them the catalogs, newspapers, and magazines, which allowed her to earn some income from her work, but she always pursued portrait and landscape painting. This painting of Cherokee Park is a wonderful example of her work that really holds up against her male contemporaries, including Carl Brenner and Harvey Joyner. She was very active in the local community, and she worked as a newspaper critic, teacher, she was a member and founder of several organizations that promoted arts in the city. She was also a suffragist and she donated her work to the suffrage cause. She held annual exhibits in her studio, with the last one occurring just a few months before her death at the age of 73. I think it's really interesting to look at the experiences of these two women, because by doing so, we can really see how over the course of a single generation, opportunities for women in the arts really expand. Hi, I'm Jenny Cole, the Director of Collections Access at the Filson and one of the curators of the Women at Work exhibit. We're excited to welcome you in today virtually. I'm going to be telling a story from the exhibit about women reformers and club women. The mid-19th century saw a proliferation of organizations begun by women, civic, literary, religious, and activist groups. This was the women's club movement, and it lasted until about World War II, although some groups, of course, continue on today. Participants were typically white women from the middle and upper class who were well-educated. They wanted to continue their own self-improvement along with the improvement of their communities, championing education, philanthropy, and civic enhancement. In the Women at Work exhibit, we highlight several organizations and clubs, such as the Louisville Women's Club, the Business Women's Club, 
the Home for Friendless Women, and the National Council of Jewish Women, Louisville section, just to name a few. Today I'm spotlighting a woman's organization that was a member of the Black Women's Club movement. Like their white counterparts, Black women's clubs were interested in self-improvement and education, but they also placed an additional emphasis on racial pride and advancement. The Sisters of the Mysterious Ten was a Black woman's benevolent society whose members supported one another and dedicated themselves to racial progress. It was the sister organization of the United Brothers of Friendship, which formed in Louisville in 1861. Both organizations expanded from Louisville, establishing their respective temples and lodges throughout the Midwest and beyond. In the 1890s, combined membership was around 250,000, making it the second largest black fraternal organization in the country. Members of the sisters were usually related to men in the United Brothers, although other women could be admitted. Applicants had to be of good moral character between the ages of 15 and 45 and able to pass a medical exam. Members could be called on to nurse six sisters and were expected to attend funeral ceremonies. The Filson's holdings on the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten come from a member of the organization named Denny Thompson. We have two of her organizational manuals, both published in 1880, her ceremonial sword, and an image of her in her society uniform. The Filson acquired these materials from Frances Ingram, the head social worker at the neighborhood house, a settlement house where Miss Denny Thompson worked in the 1920s and 30s as a housekeeper. Denny Thompson was born into slavery in Louisville, Kentucky in 1857. Her mother, Diana, and her grandmother, Phyllis Thurston, were enslaved on John Speed's plantation, Farmington. At the death of John Speed, Denny's mother, Diana, and her children were willed to a daughter, Mary Speed. When working at the neighborhood house, Denny Thompson found out that one of her colleagues, a social worker, Elizabeth Arterburn Wilson, was descended from the Arterburn slave traders. She told Miss Wilson about her family's interactions with the Arterburns and that her mother had tried to escape her enslavers several times, sometimes with Denny in tow, only to be caught and returned through the Arterburn slave pens. Miss Frances Ingram, the head resident at Neighborhood House, had this to remember about Denny Thompson. She said, mother ran away with me and my brother because she was afraid they would sell her at Arterburn's pen. It was a place down here on First Street where they used to sell slaves just like cattle. Mother had 11 children and they sold them all except Henry and me. Elizabeth Wilson's reminiscences illuminate Denny Thompson's experiences with the Sisterhood of the Mysterious Ten as well. Wilson remembers pulling her money with four other social workers to buy Denny Thompson a ceremonial sword as seen here in our exhibit. The sword was purchased at a pawn shop and was actually from a different organization, not the Sisterhood of the Mysterious Ten. Miss Thompson was originally hesitant, but really came to embrace it. It had her, has her name inscribed on it on the inside. You can only see the case here. And she proudly wore it in parades. I also think that Miss Thompson would have really embraced the Sisterhood's organizational goals of racial pride and advancement. Another memory of Miss Thompson that Frances Ingram relates in a document is what Miss Thompson's response was when Ingram, who was her boss, referred to her as auntie, which is a typical term that white people often used to talk to older black women in the turn of the 19th into 20th century. Ingram remembers, with gentle dignity and a little hauteur in her tone, Denny said, excuse me, honey, but first I must tell you not to call me auntie. I ain't no kin to you, and I don't allow any white person to call me auntie. In the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten, Thompson, who never married, likely found a social support network, opportunities to do charitable work, and participate in demonstrations and drills. Denny Thompson died on the 7th of March, 1939, and was buried in Eastern Cemetery in the lot of St. Mary's Temple Number 2, Sisters of the Mysterious Ten. I'd like to thank two people for their assistance and research on Denny Thompson and the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten. Mrs. Winita White spent a lot of time talking to me about her own personal research on Ms. Thompson, um, and I have learned so much from her. And Mr. Penn Bogert, who is one of my former colleagues from here at the Filson, has done a lot of research on the enslaved people at Farmington and their descendants. And both, of this, both of these individuals' research was critical to us being able to tell these stories today. Thank you so much for joining us to learn more about the Women at Work exhibit and these amazing women from our past. Please go to our online exhibit to read more and see more closely 
these items in our exhibit. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brooks Vessels. I'm the Museum Collections Assistant at the Filson Historical Society, and I'm going to talk about the dressmakers featured in the Women at Work exhibit. This first dress was made by Madame Mulvaney. She was a French woman who moved to Louisville in the 1880s, and she worked at many successful department stores around town. In 1881, she began working at Sharp and Middleton Department Store, where she was actually co-workers with Madame Glover, another dressmaker featured in this exhibit. She worked there until 1886, when she began working at J.C. Seashoals & Co., where she later became the chief modest. She was best described by a writer for the 1889 issue of The Critic as an accomplished and attractive French lady who has all the fashions of Paris at her finger ends. She puts that indescribably Parisian flavor into her creations. In the originality of her designs and their individual beauty and charm, she can't be surpassed. And I would have to agree, this dress is really exquisite. The detail she put into the front of the garment just really shows her uh, level of craftsmanship. This white dress and the blue suit in the center back row were designed by Madame Grunder, who started her dressmaking business in 1866 when she was only about 19 years old. Her business grew and she quickly gained success, but she lost much of her independence after she was married in 1873. Under the system of coverture, she lost many of her legal rights and all of her finances were now under the control of her husband. Madame Grunder was a primary wage earner for her family and she wasn't satisfied with the way her husband managed her finances, so in 1887, she submitted a petition to become a femme soul, which would restore the rights she had lost at marriage and give her full control over her business. Her petition was successful and she maintained ownership of her dressmaking establishment until her death in 1920. This pink dress and the red dress on the other end of the platform were made by Madame Glover, who was also around 19 years old when she entered the dressmaking business. She was a head dressmaker at both Close and Masson and Sharp and Middleton department stores in her early 20s. Newspapers claim that by her wedding at age 25, Madame Glover had already made more trousseaus than any other dressmaker in town. In 1886, she married Mr. Walter E. Glover, a successful businessman in the hotel and insurance industries. Soon after their marriage, Walter abandoned his previous work in order to manage the finances of his wife's rapidly growing dressmaking business. Unlike Madame Grunder's husband, Walter proved to be a very smart businessman and the Glovers thrived as partners opening their own dressmaking parlors to great success. All the debutantes in Louisville were said to have worn Madame Glover gowns in the early 1900s, and she was one of the most popular dressmakers in the era. This last dress was made by Mary Cummings Beauty, who opened her design studio in 1914 and was one of the few remaining custom dressmakers who gained success in the industry despite the rise in ready-to-wear clothing. Though Beauty lacked formal business training, she opened Mary Cummings Incorporated which thrived for nearly 25 years and employed as many as 400 women as sales representatives, seamstresses, dressmakers, and designers. Her brand relied on personalized service, a tailored fit, and an aura of exclusivity, which set the business apart from the assembly line garments available in department stores. Beauty's most famous client was Sarah Delano Roosevelt, who actually wore one of Mary Cummings' designs to her son's presidential inauguration. The Filson also has a number of Beauty's fashion plates, as well as a collection of her custom-made jewelry, which is featured here in this exhibit. Hi, my name is Jana Meyer. I'm an associate curator of collections here at the Filson. And today I want to talk to you about two documents that we have on display in our exhibit that tell the story of a woman named Eliza Tevis. And the reason we included these documents is that we also wanted to use her story to explore women's legal rights in the 19th century. Um, we're talking about a time when women had restricted rights compared to men. Uh, married women, in particular, um, were living under a system called coverture, um, in which their husbands represented or covered um, their political and legal interests. Um, and so married women at this time 
couldn't own or transfer ownership of property. Um, they didn't have control over their earnings. Um, and they couldn't do things like sue for economic grievances. Um, however, um, despite kind of the letter of the law, some women found ways to exert control over their circumstances. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to see with the story of Eliza Tevis. Um, Eliza was born into slavery um, about 1800, um, and she probably in Virginia. Um, a little bit later in her life, um, she shows up in Kentucky, um, and she's enslaved by brothers John and Thomas Hundley, who own a large estate in southeast Jefferson County. She's emancipated in 1833. Um, for the next couple years, she works for Thomas Hundley, um, and when he dies in 1838, um, he leaves her some property, money, and household furnishings um, in his will. Um, however, we'll see in 1839, uh, with this document here, um, that Eliza's not satisfied with the terms of the will. She ends up hiring two lawyers, um, Robert Tyler and James Guthrie, um, and in this agreement, um, they are suing the Hundley estate for a thousand dollars of withheld wages. Um, Eliza had been working for Thomas Hundley um, for the past several years um, as a housekeeper, um, and she wanted the $200 a year that she was owed. Um, in March 1840, she wins her case, and um, the court uh, awards her $500. Um, which is a significant victory for a woman of color at the time. Um, and so Eliza has become a, women, a woman who um, has some material wealth. Uh, moving forward in time to 1843, um, we see with the second document here that Eliza is planning to get married. Um, this is a marriage bond um, from 1843, um, showing that she plans to marry a man named Henry Tevis. Um, however, uh, under the system of coverture, um, Eliza would have to turn over her possessions, um, her money, um, to Henry's control when she gets married. And she's just not really into that. Um, she ends up getting in touch with her lawyer, James Guthrie, again, um, and they draw up a prenuptial agreement. Um, Eliza deeds her possessions in trust to Guthrie, um, and he sets them aside for her own separate use during her marriage. Um, and so she maintains a right to do things uh, like create her own last will and testament, um, and so she can uh, divide her estate as she sees fit. We didn't have any visual representation of Georgetta and Ella Manser in the collection, um, and so we hired Irene to work on a piece um, representing them and women like them. Um, who uh, were working very hard in low-paid positions. And you'll get to hear Irene talk a bit more about that piece as well. My name is Irene Mudd. Uh, I'm a Louisville artist and illustrator, and I collaborated with the Filson on the Women at Work exhibition. Um, my background is in fiber art and painting, um, but I do a wide range of media. Um, one project that I worked, started working with the Filson for was my knitted portrait series. Um, so I take, uh, the process is that I, I take antique photographs and scan them. Um, and then I basically digitize them on a knitting chart um, and then hand, hand knit them. Um, and this series is kind of meant to highlight erasures in women's history and women's stories that have kind of been downplayed or lost over time. Um, so I was asked, the, the curators of this exhibition asked me to help them create a portrait, two portraits actually, um, to kind of stand in for these women that are, uh, there was no photographic um, portraits or evidence of their existence. Um, so the first one was of Eliza Tevis. Um, she was a 
formerly enslaved woman who, um, after gaining her freedom, um, became a really successful businesswoman in Louisville. And uh, they, the, the curators weren't able to find any photographs of her, which was often the case for um, especially enslaved women um, or formerly enslaved women. And they often weren't identified. Um, so our solution to having some sort of representation of what she may have looked like um, was to find historical photos uh, from Kentucky and Louisville of uh, enslaved women and formerly enslaved women. And we basically chose a couple and combined them together um, digitally. And then I used that and gridded it out and created a knitting chart with it and basically created a new image of a woman um, to kind of be a stand-in for Eliza. The second portrait was a bit more conceptual. Um, this is not meant to be a stand-in for any one woman, but more so a representation of all the factory workers, uh, the women who are factory workers, mill workers, um, at the turn of the century that um, worked long hours uh, for, for very small wages, but it was like one of the first opportunities women had to enter the workforce. And um, many of these women were poor, um, very young, and we wanted to create sort of a, a portrait to represent them. So this, we used a similar technique um, that we used for the Eliza Tevis portrait, where we found multiple um, photos of factory workers um, and kind of combined a few together to create a new image of a woman um, that sort of um, pays homage to those women shop workers. Um, so the reason I, I choose to hand knit these portraits is because um, knitting and other forms of handicraft were often one of the few forms of creative expression women were allotted um, that were socially acceptable. Um, many of them weren't allowed to be in art schools or take lessons um, in art classes. So, um, but knitting and quilting and sewing were a few forms of creative expression that they were allowed. Um, so I view using hand knitting as sort of a way to connect with those female ancestors um, who, yeah, have had their work devalued over time because it is in the realm of craft. I hope everybody enjoyed that video tour and hearing from the curators. I, I certainly did. Having been in the room, it was really fantastic to uh, hear some of the voices that, uh, that put that exhibit together. And now we get to do the same. Please remember to put your uh, questions uh, down in the, the chat box. Um, the first one I saw was, uh, was Emily West uh, complimenting the, the exhibit development team for being very inclusive. And I wondered if um, throwing this out to, to all of the, the people who participated in the development of the exhibit, they could talk about that development and research process and, and how we, we made sure um, to include as many as we could. I'm happy to start and answer for that. Um, and I hope, I hope some of the other curators will jump in too. It was something that was really, really important to us um, as not only a curatorial team, but as an organization to really work to try to tell um, a complete story or a more complete story. I don't know that we can ever tell a complete story. And we found that to be absolutely challenging. Um, it's, it's easier for upper class or middle class or well-educated individuals, um, groups, organizations to have their records preserved just because they are thinking about it. They have connections to places like the Filson. So Sussing out other stories can be challenging, but it's something we're absolutely committed to. I think I would say in all of our exhibit work and of course in the publication work, um, Patrick, that you're doing a lot on as well. So um, 
being able to tell stories like Eliza Tevis and Denny Thompson through the things we do have, but then also working with um, artists and other organizations to tell the stories we don't was just something we really, really, really worked hard to do. Um, so I hope some of the other curators will chime in on that. Yeah, I think it, what was interesting was we learned a lot about what we have and don't have in our exhibits or in our collections. And that kind of um, has been an eye opener as to the types of things we need to be looking for and collecting um, going forward. And we wanted to try to, even if we didn't have particular items that could represent women's stories, we made sure that in all of our theme panels and larger text that we tried to look at not only the experience of middle and upper class women, but of working class and women of color as well. Even if we didn't have a specific object, we still tried to put them within the context of the exhibit. And in our intro panel, we also acknowledge right up front that um, our collection has gaps because of the history of our organization and the way things were collected and who was collecting and who was donating. And um, that's something that we're definitely um, looking at um, going forward as an institution. Fantastic. Um, we've got some, some really excellent questions coming in. Um, one about the, the, the business of dressmaking. Um, where did these women get the funding to start these businesses and how did they, they sort of get off the ground? I can speak to that one a little bit. Um, so it kind of varied, I think. Um, and, you know, I, I think a couple of the women who were featured in the exhibit, um, they really kind of worked their way into owning their own businesses. So Madam Grunder and Madam Glover, um, well, Madam Glover in particular, she started working at a department store in Louisville um, and kind of worked her way into being the head of the dressmaking department there. Um, Madam Grunder actually started her business, I believe it was in her own home. Um, and so she just hung out a sign um, saying that she was doing dressmaking. Um, and then, you know, I think Madam Mulvaney also worked in department stores um, and then kind of worked her way to become head of dressmaking department. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of these women um, probably had some sewing skills and, and continued to develop them um, and, and got their name out there really, I think, um, and, you know, um, kind of became very popular um, and, and sought after. That's really fascinating to hear about those department stores as, as almost as sort of launching points for those people to get their name out there and build up some clientele and some name recognition and then they can shift off um, into their own private business. Um, we have another a few questions about department stores actually so we can keep rolling on that theme. Um, wondering what was the average wage for uh, the women who were working in these, these stores at the time is, and, and how does that compare to other waged work in Louisville? Is that a living wage? Can they support themselves? Can they support a family? What do we know about how they're compensated? I don't have any numbers on that um, in particular, but I will say the women who were heading the dressmaking departments at department stores um, would, have, would have been making a pretty substantial wage. Um, they would have had considerable authority um, in that role. Um, a lot of them made annual trips to Europe um, and they did, they, they brought back fabric um, and you know, studied the latest fashions. Um, and so, and they would have been in charge of a team of workers um, at the department stores and uh, the, the workers at the department stores, now they would have been paid a lot less. These were seamstresses doing kind of the basic sewing tasks. Um, Although I will say uh, seamstresses in department stores were um, treated a bit better maybe than, um, you know, if they were working for a private individual just because the work was less seasonal and so it was more consistent. Um, the working conditions may have been a bit better too um, for seamstresses working in department stores um, because um, they, uh, you know, could uh, 
the just the the workspace itself um, was better than what they might experience um, in other situations. So, yeah, uh, but seamstresses typically weren't making a lot of money. They were really just kind of trying to scrape by, and there were a lot of women who were working in those roles. Um, thousands of women in Louisville and other cities um, at, the, at that time. Fantastic. Um, I'm wondering, uh, shifting a little bit now to the, the, the more curatorial and research side of things, um, Maureen mentioned the, the, and Jenny mentioned the, the absences and the gaps in our collection based on our own institutional history. Um, hypothetical here, if you could add one piece and everybody can chime in here, if you could add one piece to this exhibit that we don't have that might not exist anymore, um, what is the, the thing that you think would have really topped this off? Surely somebody's got a good one. That's a great question. And I think one of the things that we didn't really go into, although um, Jenny wrote the intro panel and talks about this in the intro panel to the exhibit, is all of the work that women have done all along for centuries within the home, working on the farm, raising children. And so I think, um, these are things that we sometimes have examples of in the collection, but they're often not documented. Um, going back to what Irene was saying, um, when things were collected um, and brought into the collection, especially if they were women's items, they didn't document who owned them, who used them. Um, unlike the artifacts that we have related to portraits, um, male civic leaders, um, military items, they come very well documented with names and information. And so this history of women's domestic work is really not well articulated um, either um, you know, in the historical record, so to speak, it kind of just go, it kind of just gets lost um, and goes unrecorded and undocumented. So I think if we could expand the exhibit, I would really love to see more on women's domestic roles because that is work and always has been and continues to be today. Yeah, absolutely. And our, our colleague, Abby Glogauer has put a, a comment in the chat um, for those not following, um, that talks about the, the piecework system um, where many women are, are participating in this economy by, by performing this labor of producing clothing. Um, but that's not taking place outside of the house, right? It's taking place with work that they bring home with them. Um, that is, is not really sort of hourly in the way that we think about it. It's by the piece. And so their labor is again, sort of lost and obscured in all of this. There is not a workplace necessarily for them. And so we have this, um, this, this, again, this difficulty in documenting. Jenny, I think you might have been ready to speak. No, I, the other thing that Abby mentioned was it would be neat if women's work uniforms were saved and not just their wedding dresses. And I think this, this goes along with what Maureen said as well, but just having some more, um, I hate to say mundane, because what is mundane and what is not, but having the ability to tell stories with visual documentation, whether that's a letter or a photograph or, or an artifact, of more of a day-to-day -day existence. Um, and that could be, you know, that could be a woman, you know, in, in various neighborhoods in Louisville or who worked for a, a wealthier family in Louisville. We're lucky that we have some collections like that where the documentation kind of comes, uh, comes to us through the cracks. In some way, that's, that's how Denny Thompson's materials came to us. It wasn't Denny herself giving them. It was because she left them at the neighborhood house during the 1937 flood when she was moved there and so someone who had more of a connection to the Filsons was able to donate them to us. We have another great collection of a woman named Margaret Smith, who was um, a housekeeper and a domestic worker with the Hayburn family. We have her papers because the Hayburns gave them to us. So I think um, a lot of that's about building connections and building relationships. And um, that's what I would like to have seen was just uh, maybe drilling down some levels um, to really get the perspective of, um, of a, a broader swath of the socioeconomic Ohio Valley. Thanks. Yeah, I'll add on to that a little bit. Um, one thing that I would have liked to see with the exhibit 
um, and kind of thinking about these women who are doing um, the, the piecework sewing. Um, we actually feature two women in our exhibit named Georgetta and Ella Manser um, who were doing that kind of work. Um, they were working from home uh, really long hours and they were you know, paid by um, the, the pieces of garments that they created. And we have one letter that their mother wrote that talks about this work that they were doing. Um, they apparently were working from sun up to sundown um, and they had hundreds of garments in the house, um, she, and she writes. Um, and so I guess, you know, what I would like to see is, is something, um, something uh, more physical, I guess, to kind of represent that story. You know, we just have this letter. We, we don't um, have kind of any um, more tangible representation, um, any kind of image of these women, um, who they were, um, just just the letter. And so um, that would be a nice thing to have in, been able to include in the exhibit. The thing that I would have in, wanted to include in our exhibit is really similar to what Jenny said and what Abby mentioned. Um, we have a lot of women's clothing in the collection, but it's really just like the upper echelon of women's clothing. We have ball gowns, we have wedding dresses, but we have uh, very few items that were just day wear, especially day wear of lower and middle class women. Um, and it's a little bit harder to picture the lives of these shop girls when we don't have that kind of physical representation. So it would have been great if we were able to include some more physical objects like a dress or a photograph of them. Um, that would be the main thing that I would want to include. And then to talk a little bit about the piecework, Madam Glover was a big proponent of doing that kind of work, which isn't necessarily a great thing, but that was like a big part of her business model is she had women that were specially trained to do lace work or just patterning or crocheting. So she, one of the things that was built into her business model was finding women who were really specialized in those areas. So then they could take that work home and spend all their time just perfecting their craft as lace makers or knitters. Got a really fantastic question in here about, um, do we have anything in the exhibit or I think um, parenthetically sort of in the broader Filson collections that documents um, uh, women leading in education and religion around these times? What, what stories could we tell there? That's a great question and thanks for asking that. Um, we actually do have an entire section on the exhibit related to education in the 19th century. Unfortunately for the tour and the talk, we had to kind of limit what we could talk about. But it, if you go to the online exhibit, um, there's some great information there. Um, one of the main women that we talk about is Julia Tevis and she ran the Science Hill um, Academy that was out of Shelbyville. And she started that very early on, I think it was 1820s, um, she started that. And what's interesting about her is when she got married, she said, I want to continue to teach. Teaching is my passion. And her husband had to agree to that before they would get married. And so after they were married, um, she starts to have her own children and she um, opens up this seminary. And at first they have, I think, 20 students the first year. And then it goes up to the hundreds of students each year. And um, she managed the school, she taught at the school, she hired a lot of other teachers to help work with her. And she was really ahead of her time because not only was she teaching things like literature and music, the normal things that women um, in the antebellum period were expected to learn, she was also teaching them um, advanced mathematics, advanced science. She taught chemistry. She thought chemistry was important, um, not only so that women would understand how to use the chemicals found in their households, like cleaning agents, so they wouldn't poison anybody, but she also loved chemistry for its um, sheer properties of um, scientific exploration, just to understand the world around you. And so she really pushes these advanced subjects on the women that she's teaching. And she influenced um, thousands of young women in the state um, over her career. And um, we also have another interesting section 
where um, we look at the um, experience of getting an education at another seminary, um, Elizabethtown Seminary in Ohio, from a student's perspective. So it's a really interesting um, section of the exhibit, and I encourage you to check that out online. I think um, the couple of things that we have in the exhibit that are relevant to women in religion, um, I worked a little bit with those. And one was um, information from the Nas National Council on Jewish Women's Global section that they loaned to us. And a big thanks to them for partnering with us on this. Um, and it was a lot about, about you know, fundraising and work that they wanted to do um, for education and school education and, and bringing children in, um, in to, to get to get some of that. And, and then likewise, there we also had a letter from the um, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up the name, Hebrew Benevolent, Jewish Ladies Benevolent Society number one, which was likewise a um, work they were doing fundraising for Jewish hospital that came in with our Jewish hospital materials that we have at the Filson. And I think that you could mirror that with um, other women from other religions doing work in benevolent type societies. Um, less, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head in our collection that would be a woman leader in a church, um, just because that's kind of wasn't much of a thing uh, throughout much of history. But I do think that there's a lot of evidence of women providing services and and benevolence, you might say, through through religious organizations. We do also um, have a section in the exhibit um, where we talk about the women's club movement. Um, and I do think um, a number of these um, clubs that women are joining in um, the late 19th, early 20th century, there's really a prolifer proliferation of clubs at this time. And I do think a lot of them have kind of um, a moral um, undertone to them. Um, you know, women are becoming involved in these to really better their communities um, and, and do improvement projects. Um, and so I, I think a number of these clubs, you know, they're, um, uh, women have religious motivations for joining them. Thanks for those responses. I wanted to circle back to a question that we got in the chat about Irene's um, production process for those knitted portraits. And she was generous enough to, to answer it in the chat, but I wonder if, um, if she would pop in and, and give an on-camera answer and talk about um, sort of the, the timeline and the work that went into those. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned in the chat, um, the portraits uh, take about three weeks to a month, depending on how complicated they are. Um, and as I explained in my video, the process is um, generating those images, which I, I had never done before this commission. So that was really interesting um, of, of taking multiple photographs and basically making them transparent and layering them over each other. Uh, and then I had to like mess a lot with contrast and like the lighting and stuff um, to get it to where I could use it in a knitting chart. Um, and then I like uploaded that onto this, there's this free um, software called Knit Pro where you images uh, and it graphs it um, into like a knitting or crochet chart. Um, so I did that and then the actual like knitting of it um, is very time consuming and um, meticulous. So I would, yeah, I would guess about um, about a three week process per portrait um, and just, and working with the curators to just make sure we were getting the right, the right image and the right um, uh, vibe from the portraits. Um, so yeah, so it was a pretty time intensive uh, process, but it was, so, so it was like one of the coolest things I've ever done. It was, it was awesome working on this exhibition. Uh, and thank you so much to the Filson for this opportunity. I'll speak for us and, and say how, how, I, I, how incredible I think it is that, that we're including your work in there to represent perspectives that we 
um, do not otherwise have. And I love the, the model that that sets for um, sort of our collaboration um, in future exhibitions. Um, we had a really uh, interesting question. Uh, I like these fun ones. Um, did you learn anything that surprised you? Um, anyone during the, the work on this exhibit? There's always something fun. Uh, I think one thing that surprised me, um, I was doing some research on the Business Women's Club, um, which was in downtown Louisville. Um, and they had, a, they had a club building that was built in the early 1900s. Um, and they had a lunchroom that was um, managed by a woman named Jenny Benedict, um, who was a famous restaurateur here in Louisville. Um, but what surprised me about the lunchroom was that um, it was created as a space where working women could go and eat lunch um, downtown um, when they had their lunch break. Um, and, you know, they, they would go to the business women's club because they weren't um, supposed to eat at other restaurants in downtown Louisville um, without a male chaperone. Um, so you had all these women who were entering the workforce, um, working in Louisville, and they don't have a place to eat lunch. Um, and so the Business Women's Club is providing that for them. So that just, that kind of fascinated me. We also got to take a tour of that building courtesy of Lauren Johnson, who I thanked at the beginning of, uh, of this talk, which was really, I thought really interesting to see, you know, the bones of the structure and the different sections that would have, um, would have been there. I definitely, definitely think um, that learning about that club was, was something I knew not, very little about and was really intrigued. And I, I didn't do the research, Janet did the research, but I enjoyed learning about it um, along, definitely along with her. Um, for myself, this didn't actually happen during the research for the exhibit, but Janet and I both have done work on Denny Thompson. And while I was working on a reference question um, for a PhD candidate that I've been working with while we're closed to the public, I came across Francis Ingram, the head resident of Neighborhood House, um, writing about a story about Denny. And her name is never mentioned, but I knew who she meant because I had been involved enough in that. And so getting some of her, her words, still through Francis Ingram, but getting some of Ms. Thompson's words, um, her feelings about slavery, being enslaved, her mother's enslavement um, was just really powerful for me. So I wanted to make sure I wound some of that into, um, into my part of the video, but that was something that was surprising just because I didn't expect to find it. And I wish I would have had it a little bit earlier so I could have put more into the exhibit about it or we could have, but um, that was really, it was a neat experience for me. I would just add real quick for me, um, with uh, Magdalene McDowell, she had been wanting to be an architect since she was um, 20 years old. And she would, in her teens and 20s and 30s, um, design buildings for her family members. You know, if, if she could build their house, this is what she would build. And she was in her 70s when she actually designed and saw houses built. And then she was in her 80s when she designed the um, children's building for the blue glass, Bluegrass Sanatorium. So it was really interesting. I didn't expect to see that, you know, in her 70s and 80s is when she starts to really see her dreams um, come to life. And I thought that was really um, inspiring and also empowering as well. I think it's really fascinating how this exhibit has has sort of spanned um, the changes that that 2020 has brought to uh, our fields of, of museums and art and culture and, and research and, and libraries. I wonder if you all could speak, uh, especially because we have such sort of varied professional backgrounds represented on our panel today about how your work um, today surrounding this exhibit or, or just just sort of generally as professionals in these fields has changed. Um, since you started planning this exhibit in another world.
you're asking, they're dropping the hard question at the very end, Patrick. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, the main thing for me that's changed is not getting to go to all of the openings that I was anticipating going to, because we were, you know, Women at Work was one of, I don't even know how many exhibits celebrating women that was happening in 2020. Um, and I know Amanda from the Frasier is on this call. We worked a lot with them. We worked a lot with the Women's Club. We worked with Conrad Caldwell House. We were really looking forward to sort of supporting one another physically um, the way we always try to. And that was a really big blow. I mean, not only did our exhibit opening get shut down, like the day, the day that Filson closed was the day we were supposed to have this exhibit opening. Um, but I really haven't, other than through video, been able to see the other exhibits I was hoping to see or go to the talks I was hoping to go to. So for me, I think just that sort of light switch going off on so much was really jarring. But at the same time, being able to flip it, and Emily, I think, mentioned that in the chat, Emily, our, our former colleague, that we were able to then immediately get it into a virtual exhibit and get some of the collaborative work we were doing with Conrad Caldwell and the Women's Club into a virtual exhibit. and have you know some of our things shown at the Frasier because they're they've been able to open. I mean that's been really positive to see what what our different capacities are, how we can continue to support each other and really doing that in a virtual way um, and being able to do that, being able to have more people at these kinds of talks because they can hop on virtually um, is is wonderful. We, we're getting people from all over the country, all over the world, and it's it's been a great way to interact. Um, for me personally, working a lot with reference here it's been a huge change, um, not having people come in the door and we've revamped a lot. I hope, I hope to everyone's satisfaction, but that, that's that been for me professionally and personally, the, the biggest struggle with, with this exhibit and then, and then our work. Well, seeing no other takers, we are right at one o'clock. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up. Thanks to everyone in the audience for joining today, for, for throwing some good questions um, our way. And thank you so much to um, these curators, not only for this wonderful exhibit, but also for taking the time today uh, to make yourselves open to, uh, to talking about this process. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody.